Let's begin with something that currently is affecting us all, public health, especially during the pandemic. Chris, let's start with the domestic policy uh, side. How would you characterize the two candidates' pandemic policy positions, and where would you see career-related activities under the two future scenarios? Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think the sort of basic uh, disagreement between the two candidates or the basic uh, delineation of their policy uh, uh, projections is, is their thinking about the role of the federal government in the pandemic response itself um, and sort of the willingness to rely on the public health uh, experts uh, sort of regardless of the outcome. Um, we've seen uh, President Trump um, a little more reticent to, to uh, play up the, the need for certain measures to be taken or uh, and downplay the threat of the virus generally. I think, um, you know, he, he wanted to run on, on a strong economy and, and therefore was hesitant to take many steps that would uh, have a, a, a negative impact on the economy. Um, that left us with a situation where the governors, um, particularly at the outset, uh, mayors, other sort of executive state and local level were um, left to their own devices to kind of set up their policies and procedures for uh, testing and contract tracings and, and, and things such as that. Um, <clears throat> I think it, uh, Biden uh, has expressed more of a willingness to uh, bring a little bit of leadership role back into the federal government, um, put some national standards forward, um, talk of mask mandates and things if, if those are, are, are doable, um, you know, and, and, and sort of set an example as to where the states should go uh, with their policies. Um, you know, he kind of thinks that you can't really get the economy back on track until you've addressed the virus. So, you know, maybe more of a willingness to listen to the public health experts, even if it stings a little uh, <clears throat> economically. Um, there's a debate playing out in the Congress um, that sort of either candidate, depending on how they win, or depending on who wins, uh, would, would take up the mantle of, which is, uh, after the passage of the CARES Act uh, back in April, May timeframe, uh, we all kind of thought that there was gonna be a pretty quickly thereafter, another bill, large bill, uh, relief bill. Um, and that as of yet hasn't happened. And I don't anticipate that it will um, until after the election. Uh, the timeframe there will be different depending on who wins, I think. I think um, if, if, if it's the status quo, Trump remains the president and the Senate remains in Republican hands, you're likely to see action <clears throat> before the end of the year on a smaller sort of relief package uh, to, to kind of clear the deck uh, for, for the next um, term. So that's not sort of hanging over his head as he enters his second term. Um, they are much more focused on, uh, you know, support for small businesses, uh, liability protections for businesses, the airline industry, uh, things such as that. Whereas the Democrats um, and, and, and likely Biden uh, are much more willing to, to go big on this piece of legislation. The House has already passed um, the HEROES Act, they've called it two versions of it, one at 3.4 trillion, one at 2.2 trillion, um, which encompass all those things uh, as well as significant funding for state and local governments, healthcare workers, you know, and other measures. Um, should Biden win, and and particularly if the Senate flips to to the Democrats, uh, you can expect a much larger piece of legislation. Uh, probably, though, not until the first the first quarter of next year. I think, in terms of uh, the jobs situation this presents, uh, I think it's a growing public policy sector regardless uh, of who wins. I mean, there's going to be a lot of, of uh, attention paid to this. Um, I think, you know, if it's a Biden administration, obviously there'll be more roles within the federal government. Um, there'll be more of an emphasis on sort of understanding what's going on now and, and, and planning for another uh, potential pandemic. Um, but that's not to say in a Trump administration, I think there'll still be a lot of jobs in, the, in, in think tanks, academia, certainly the states, um, things such as that. So I think regardless of the outcome, there'll be some opportunities here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, naturally, Richard, the pandemic's affecting not just the U.S., uh, but the world. How would you characterize the two candidates' pandemic policies from a foreign policy perspective, and what do those positions imply regarding uh, uh, activity levels? Well, the first thing to say is their, their positions on the domestic response could not be more different, and that's a foreign policy issue. 
uh, how we how we act here has all sorts of consequences for how we are perceived around the world. And I would simply say that uh, I can't imagine there's too many people around the world who uh, want to emulate our response to, to COVID-19. It will also obviously, it is having implications for our economy, for our society, all of which I think will distract us from our our ability to be active in the world. So even though we don't think of this as a quote unquote foreign policy issue, it has all sorts of adverse implications. And it's a, you know, for students watching this, it's a textbook case of why the world matters. What began in Wuhan did not stay in Wuhan. Indeed, very little stays local for, for long. And I, if people only internalize one message from COVID-19, it, it's that. And by the way, there'll be a COVID 20 something and 30 something uh, this is not a one-off event. Uh, infectious disease is, is, is part and parcel of, of, of globalization, and we need to prepare uh, for that. In terms of uh, differences in policy, besides all the domestic issues that Chris alluded to, I'd say two things, particularly on the foreign policy side. I believe a Biden administration would very quickly re-enter the World Health Organization, not because it is not flawed, but because it is flawed. And we are more likely to have influence over it if working from the inside rather than simply criticizing from the uh, uh, from the outside. I also believe the United States would probably find a way to participate in the global vaccine effort. And there's a global effort underway to develop, manufacture, and distribute a vaccine. It's the right thing to do from a public health point of view. It's the right thing to do from a humanitarian point of view. It's also the right thing to do from self-interest. If it turns out that vaccines are first developed elsewhere, we don't necessarily want to be at the end of the queue. So I think uh, the Biden administration would be uh, much more involved. In terms of careers, look, there's everything from the World Health Organization, which is part of the UN uh, system. It's also a fantastic area for NGOs, for non-governmental organizations, groups like Médecins Sans Frontières, or Doctors Without Borders, if you, if you prefer, AmeriCares, uh, the International Rescue uh, Committee. There's an endless number of groups that are helping people, vulnerable populations uh, around the world. And this could be something for those who have do medical skills, doctors, nurses, what have you, or, or a, wide, a wider set of uh, skills. So tremendous opportunity uh, there, and obviously in policymaking areas, the NSC, I think in a Biden administration, you'll probably see the standing up or the recreation of a dedicated cell of people uh, working on this. Uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations a few days ago, we just came out with a, a large task force report on preparing for the next pandemic. We called for the uh, creation of a job of a U.S. coordinator on this issue. It's a major national security challenge. And if that were to happen, there'd be a whole office of people. So I don't think there will be any shortage of uh, job opportunities, and not just at the federal government, obviously, and not just internationally, but also state, state and local.